want to know the answer to a question, there's a very simple solution. Indeed, there is. You ask them. That's what we do here. We ask. Shocker. Shocker. <laughs> Today, we have an amazing guest. I'm super excited about this. Sherry Boxstein. She leads the weather company for IBM, and they have super smart AI, but that doesn't mean that they ignore the basics. No, they don't. In fact, they have, I would say, re-engineered them because if you want to know what your customers want, you have to find out and they use this information to shape a subscription model, which I think is super exciting. It is super exciting. Sherry shares so much knowledge with us. One super interesting point that she's going to share just in a moment is talking about how she sees bundling coming in the new subscription economy. Okay, my pick would have to be super smart, short observation about advertising. You know, we are sweating IDFA, but she reminds us that all of those identifiers tell us about past behavior. Why not try to predict behavior, be therefore entirely engaging and actually very important to the customer going forward. It's just a different way of seeing the timeframes and it's certainly a new opportunity to consider. That was a great insight as well. Without any further ado, this is Sherry Boxstein, General Manager of the Weather Company and IBM Watson Advertising. So Sherry, you made a major pivot last year during a pandemic, right? You were 100% ad supported and you went to subscriptions, why? We did. Well, you know, the pandemic definitely accelerated that, but we actually made the decision probably a year before that, that that was going to be our strategy. And we were just looking for a way to diversify our revenue because, as you said, we were very dependent on advertising and not that advertising is going away. It's not, but it's really healthy to have a diversified monetization strategy. I mean, I mean, if you think about your own personal life, they always say, don't put all your money in, in one fund, right? So it's the same strategy on the business side. Um, it just helps to protect our business. And we actually see a lot of growth here. Um, and we made that decision uh, by talking to our users to see if it's something that they would even be interested in. And we found that it is. That is super interesting, Peggy. I haven't heard that one before. Before going into subscriptions, chat with your users. Would you like to see something like that? I, that is a perfect segue to the second question that we had for you. Um, you made this move to subscriptions and it was super successful. We're going to get into that in a second, but how did you do that? How'd you work through that process? So we did a lot of experimentation. You know, we had an hypothesis. We did a lot of research. Um, and as you said, John, it, we talked to our users. I mean, they are the cornerstone of a publishing business. So what were they interested in? Uh, what would they be interested in purchasing and, and subscribing? What features? We felt like we had to give a better, uh, more value exchange than we do on the free platform if we're asking people to actually pay for a subscription. So for us, it wasn't about gating features, meaning that you block features from users that were used to seeing it, it was actually about uh, strengthening that value exchange. So we did a lot of testing, a lot of talking to users. Um, some users, of course, say they will never pay for weather, and that's okay because we have the free platform. But for those that did, um, you know, really listening to what they said they wanted um, and building out a product, first and foremost, uh, that delivered on, on that. And then from there, a lot of experimenting around pricing. That's really important. What is the right price? And we did a lot of research on that, a lot of, again, asking users uh, to come up with that right price. And in the beginning, you know, we, we went out with one price and later we've changed it um, the more that we've learned. So it's been an amazing learning process, but we do a lot of growth hacking. So I'm sure you are familiar with that really small experiments to find out what's the right solution, what's that right recipe. And that's what the team's been doing. And frankly, we're still doing that. That is so amazing, um, Sherry. Peggy and I hear that quite a bit from the smarter marketers, right? Who are just learning at internet speed because they're running a ton of experiments with a ton of the different users or segments of their users at any given time, learning fast, adapting fast and growing fast. Talk to us about some of those results. So we're really happy with the results. We are we have our subscription business on our apps only. We're expanding that first and foremost to our web platforms. That's actually coming out uh, very soon, actually this month. And so 
that's the audience uh, path and the growth. But with our apps only, we're reaching a very big milestone that frankly, it's taken other publishers uh, twice the time to reach. So the adoption with our users has been really strong, um, you know, and the marketing around that um, in order to first let people know that you have the product and then get their interest up and then actually getting them then to convert to a subscriber um, has been very good. And, and I'd say, even with that big milestone, we're still in our infancy. I think there's a lot of room for growth here, uh, you know, within the subscription business. It's also really interesting how price and customizing price becomes a really big part of the model as well. I mean, your results say that, your growth speaks for it, but I'd like to understand in that growth, can you give me an idea of the scale? You know, how many devices are you reaching? How many requests are you getting? So from a weather business overall, uh, our weather data on our O and O property. So when I speak about that, it's the weather channel. And we also have weather underground. Uh, we reach about 400 million uh, users every single month. That's just on our property. But we do have strategic partnerships with some of the largest OEMs and tech companies in the world. So really our weather data is on over 2.5 billion devices around the globe. So that's our, our reach and our footprint. But as as we relate to sub subscriptions, it's really part of the O&O, so that 400 million, and, and we started domestically uh, as well, um, and so that narrows it down a little bit. Um, but you know, we just think the opportunity is really big because really only a small percentage of our users today um, are subscribers, um, but it still has been very beneficial from a business perspective. It always so interests me as people move from an ad supported model to a subscription model, because I've done multiple surveys and research about what people are willing to pay and whether they're willing to pay. One that I did just recently was on Facebook and Google. Would you pay for Facebook and Google, for instance? And we had actually about 20% of people who would be willing to pay something. But I did the math and, and Facebook is making something on the order of $160 per user per year in North America. And, and, and people will be willing to pay only a fraction of that. If every user paid or if some fraction of your users paid, would you more than replace your ad revenue? We would. I mean... You know, the walled gardens uh, definitely have an advantage when it comes to advertising. But for other publishers, um, you know, you, there is that tipping point of where a subscriber becomes more valuable than, you know, an ad supported user. Um, and so you have to look at that threshold. But the other spectrum of that, as I said, you know, John, advertising is not going away, even with the challenge of the with privacy and targeting, it's not going away, it's evolving, and, and it needs to evolve, frankly. Um, but you know, with your subscriber base, it just really comes down to giving users a choice. Um, and so we know that some of our users prefer the subscription experience, uh, and then other users prefer the free experience. So really giving the consumer a choice has been really beneficial to us. So we're talking about whether you are the weather company, you're also part of IBM. It seems unusual, but it really works well together. If we look at what's going on here under the hood, we're talking about AI, we're talking about contextual advertising, linking that with content. Um, what is key to what you're able to do? So being part of IBM, a, a couple of reasons what the acquisition happened. First, Weather is a very valuable data set and every organization and company should frankly have a weather strategy because there's really not a business that weather doesn't impact at some uh, you know, part of their supply chain. So that data was very valuable. So bringing that to IBM has been very beneficial. In turn, uh, being able to use a very sophisticated AI solution in Watson has been really beneficial for our business. Uh, we've always used AI in our weather forecasting, but now we were able to put out a brand new weather model just last year that uses uh, IBM supercomputer. So we can do really, uh, really interesting graphics, really more detailed graphics, similar to what you would see like in a, a video game and be able to you know, provide a forecast to parts of the world that never had a forecast before because they don't have government support or they don't have sophisticated satellites. And so it has enabled us to really expand our mission in providing weather data across the globe. So there's that aspect of the AI. 
But now there's this aspect of how do, else do we drive our business and give uh, consumers information that helps them make their decisions. So we have AI supporting our risk of flu uh, that, that came out last year as well. So we can tell people out 15 days if your area is in a risk area for flu. So really beneficial. We're looking actually for that for COVID. That's something that we hope to bring out next quarter um, because we know COVID, although we're all getting vaccinated, which is, which is great, um, that it can reoccur. So what is that risk in your area? And be more predictive about that. We think that'll be really helpful. And then on the advertising side of our business, uh, we are using AI to really change the foundation uh, technology within advertising because we know cookies are going away, mobile identifiers are going away. So really this business is at such an amazing inflection point that a new technology like AI can solve problems for marketers and helping to target those consumers, but do it in a way that's not using cookies, uh, doing it in a way that's more forward thinking, um, which will be great for the, the whole industry as a whole. What I really love is how you're using AI for the product as well, because, you know, product is the new marketing. I'm hearing so much. And I'm sure you are, John, as well. You know, the product really has to be right now more than ever, probably because cookies are going away and you have to be compelling in how you approach me, not just in the data driven advertising. Now, of course, you use AI for product. And you're talking about how you're using it in advertising and marketing, but are CMOs, others, leveraging AI enough right now, Sherry? Well, I wish they were leveraging it more. That would be great, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, AI is an interesting technology because um, for some people, it's kind of a buzzword. They kind of understand what it is. They're, they're not quite sure. Um, and so we've seen a very, very slow adoption within advertising mm -hmm. I think that'll speed up with all the changes that are happening. It'll, it'll kind of be a forcing function. But I think we have to do a better job of explaining the benefits of AI and how it can actually help the CMO, how it can help their organization. Um, and we certainly want to do that and, and are doing that. If you look at AI, you've seen it transform other industries, finance, mm -hmm. insurance, health, certainly healthcare. It can do the same for advertising, but there is going to be that education that's going to go with it. And, and then you have to prove it, right? You can't just say, hey, we're using AI, you should use it too. It's like someone that you know creates a uh, maybe a weight loss drink and no one in the company is actually using it, but they're saying it, it gives you the results, right? And so it's really kind of, we are actually using our own AI solutions on our publishing platform to prove that it actually works on the publishing side of our business and it can get results. And so I think that that's gonna be really important. It's, it's the education, how can this solve marketer problems and then actually living up to that by seeing those results. What have you learned about engagement, user engagement in this process of going from ads to subscribers? Are, are you changing language a little bit? Is it becoming coming from users to customers? And, and what makes a user a customer? So that's a great question. You know, I, I feel all of our users are customers. They just choose to underwrite our business a different way, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the, the user that doesn't want to pay a subscription fee. So they underwrite that by seeing advertisements. Um, if they can see targeted advertisements, it's probably going to be a better experience and, and more appealing, but that's the choice of the consumer. And then you have the consumers that want that subscription experience. They prefer to pay for a subscription service versus maybe seeing advertisements. And so, you know, we really find that there's both sides from a consumer perspective, which which we think is really great um, because it really, again, it comes down to the consumer, giving them that choice. Um, they will respond, especially if you continue to drive that value exchange. So when we looked at the subscription business, we really kind of have three tips, if, if you will, on how we feel like we've been successful. The first thing is talking to the consumer and reducing their perceived clutter in our experience. So John, what might be clutter for you might be different from what Peggy, what you want. Um, but there are those users that just want to get the weather data and get out, right? They, they open it up in the morning first thing before they get out of bed. What's my day look like? I just want that. I don't want any other stuff in my way. I just want the temperature. Is it going to rain? Uh, and so we, you know, decluttered the experience for them. So that was really that, that first thing. 
The second thing is from a subscription business, if you can humanize the experience, so can you give them more explanation to what they're seeing? Um, you know, can you bring in a meteorologist? Can you help them make context of that data? You know, just really important uh, for, for the user. And then the other thing is that, like I said, strengthening the value exchange. So we're giving them uh, more uh, features that are more in-depth, you know, a better radar experience. Not everybody likes maps, right? Um, and so for those that like maps and they really want to dig in, giving them even more data. Um, and those things have really resonated. So it is, again, kind of learning your user. Um, and they're not the same. Right. One size doesn't really fit all. Uh, we know that. I mean, Peggy, you know that, right? As women, one size never fits all. <laughs> <Never>. <laughs> right. So it's the same thing here. I have to then bring up the next question because it's true. One size never fits all. But we are always changing particular, perhaps like, perhaps women in particular. So I have to ask you, Sherry, you're talking about asking the user, following the user, accommodating the user, customizing to the user, to the customer. I'd be interested in understanding how you adapt that because you must be seeing some signals or some behavioral data or something is telling you that, yeah, John doesn't like maps now, but then he learns to love them and you have to give them to him and you have to see that. <laughs> so that's great. And that's where, you know, your first party data is really important. So users that are engaging maps. So this is how we've kind of promoted our subscriptions. So for users that go into the map, we share with them, we have a, you know, a deeper map experience if they become a subscriber, right? So we're, we're using that very targeted promotion within our own experience based on someone's behavior. Um, and so you're right, a map user today might not be a map user tomorrow. And great example of this, um, someone on my own team who, who is product said, I'm, I'm not gonna subscribe to this premium service until I have to. They're on my own team, right? You're like, Okay, well, freedom of choice, right? That's great. Big storm came. He became a subscriber because he wanted that detailed information that that map had. Um, you know, he he wanted to really understand the movement of the storm uh, in a better way, and he became a subscriber. So I, I hooked him. It, it took me like six months, but we finally hooked him, right? So, uh, but yes, you know, as we continue to build out features, and we will, there's there's no shortage of ideas. Um, we think it'll be exciting, and and like you said, Peggy, some users may just totally want to add free experience, and that's okay. But other users might say, no, I'm actually looking for a more detailed map experience. That's what's most important to me. So it is a kind of a, a variety and a, a different recipe for different users. Mm -hmm. That's really, really interesting. Everybody wants something a little different. They want it a little different way. And you're managing that complexity within the platform. Talk to me a little bit about managing retention and churn with your different customer types, right? Your ad supported customers versus your subscribers. And are there some lessons for other brands in that? So, you know, when you look at subscriptions, you're right. There's two aspects of it. There's the acquisition part. That's really where you, you use the strength of your marketing team, your CMO uh, office to help you with that because it's just like advertising, right? You're just doing it for yourself. Then there's the retention side, and that's really a product focus. You know, is the product strong enough? Are we creating enough value that the consumer wants to keep paying? Sometimes we are, sometimes we're not. Um, and then, you know, of course, there's life instances that happen, you know, where people are just cutting back expenses and so forth. Uh, and so things like that happen. But our goal is to really always increase the value that we're asking someone to pay for. Um, we think that's really important. Um, our retention, fortunately, has been pretty high. We're about 75% retention, which is great. Uh, we offer a monthly subscription and we off offer annual. Um, and so it's it's pretty high, but I, you know, we also offer a very unique product as well mm -hmm. with weather. It's something that, that you do need, but certainly you can get it from for, for free. So, you know, we are looking at that, um, looking at, you know, customers that might have the potential to churn, um, you know, how do you re-engage them, um, discount codes, you know, that's something that the technology has just recently changed within the app store that allows you to give a lot more of discount codes. So how do you build a strategic plan around that? Um, and that can be very helpful in a way of getting um, users that are have churned or about to churn to say, 
okay, you didn't like paying that price. Let us give you a discount because we have some new things that we want you to check out. So I think that's going to be a very powerful tool. And with the app stores changing the number of discounts, everybody should be really looking at that and, and using that strategically as a retention driver. Peggy, isn't it amazing how sophisticated the app business is getting? I mean, it's becoming like a real business in the real world with all kinds of real world stuff. <laughs> Features, products, value proposition. I remember and it was just gaming the system, but I didn't really <laughs> say that. But it was indeed. Um, it's not the only thing changing. Um, we're also going to see a lot of change because we have an increased focus on privacy, right? Mm -hmm. We have IDFA. How are you going to still do ads in this changing environment? Wow, that's a loaded question, Peggy, because, uh, you know, I think everybody's trying to, to work through that. You know, I, I definitely think there's some great short term solutions out in the marketplace with uh, universal IDs, um, you know, with some other technologies. Contextual, I think, will be a really big thing for mm -hmm. publishers that have first party data. They'll be able, you know, really start leveraging that data probably in a bigger way than they have before. So that'll be important. But we also think that AI technology and ad tech solutions rooted in AI will be a foundational technology to help us uh, move into the next era of advertising. And I say that because AI, a little bit different than the cookie, and we'll give that an example. Um, cookie tells publishers, marketers what's happened in the past, right? So if I look at my business weather, if I only told people what happened in the past, might be interesting, but it's not going to be very helpful. It wasn't going to help the people last night in the Southeast that got, you know, uh, severe weather and tornadoes. It wasn't going to help them because it's not predictive. AI takes that to the next level. It can take different signals and it actually can predict out the behavior for marketers. Um, and so it's real forward thinking in that way and really at more of advanced technology. So we actually think that this can be foundational for the industry. Um, and there are components of it that can be more privacy forward. Um, AI can use all kinds of signals, but it's not dependent on a cookie or a traditional mobile ID, which we think is really important. So it's, it's great that, um, you know, really as a ad ecosystem, we're all kind of working together to find these solutions. I think we need to keep doing that. Um, and we also need to protect the open web. We think that that's really important. Sherry, that's maybe the best explanation I've heard. And I've heard a lot of explanations about how advertisers use AI, how product people in the mobile space use AI. It's probably the best explanation I've ever heard around, hey, AI can tell you what somebody might want to do next where, versus the third-party cookie or the IEFA or the GAID. They tell you what happened in the past. That's bits of data. Some of them are staying, some of them are going, but knowing what people want next is really critical. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's great. So I'm curious, you guys have been in the business a long time. You know, what are your thoughts around subscriptions and, um, you know, are you subscribers yourself? I am for what, for what I value, because I just want to know that it's always going to be updated. It's always going to be as good as I, as I want. And the fact that I can always get out when I want, which I don't usually because it's just the, the fact that you're free to choose. I can always go back to the ad-supported version. I did a, a little um, survey of myself, <laughs> sample size of one, um, <laughs> just uh, a couple of weeks ago of how many subscriptions I have. And I think it's up to about 15 or 16 wow. right now. And so, yes, I'm deep in there. And, and, and sometimes I worry about that because it's like, you know, is my bank account a rusty bucket with a hole in the bottom that just dribbles out? But on the other hand, as Peggy says, if you're not getting value from it, you drop it. Um, and there you go. But I think it's absolutely critical. We are changing from an acquisition focused mobile growth world to a retention to an yeah. engagement focused mobile growth world where, hey, you're going to get customers in some ways similar to traditional marketing, where you've got incremental models, where you've got some uh, probabilistic data, you've got some deterministic data, you're going to get that customer and you're going to do traditional marketing and new types of growth marketing. But what are you going to do when you have that customer? How are you going to treat them? How are you going to customize the environment to them? How are you going to customize a service to them? How are you going to engage that customer and retain that customer and derive value in a way that that customer wants to give it? And as you said, some people want to pay 
and have a better experience, a richer experience, an ad-free experience. Some people want, hey, give me the basics. I'll watch a few ads and there we go. Having the mix, I think, is critical, but I think it's really important that you don't just have users, you have customers. And as you said, some of them pay with attention, some of them pay with dollars. Really, really interesting. And I think with the retention model, the consumer wins, right? Because it kind of puts publishers on notice. You got to have a quality product, right? You have to deliver value for your customer or they're not going to stick around. There's too much competition. And, and frankly, that's why competition is so good. And so I, you know, I believe in this model, the consumer really wins because they get a better product um, and, you know, they get their needs met. So um, I, I think it's, it's a great, uh, you know, business to be in. And um, it's exciting to create new features, exciting features, you know, that, that consumers and customers really want. We're talking about the value exchange. And I know, Sherry, that you are very big on contextual advertising. And is there a value? And what is that value in being predictive? Because you made that point. Use advertising, I'm looking at the past. Used Using AI, I'm looking in the future. What is there for the value of that predictive, future-oriented approach? So really, you know, in our weather business, it's all about giving people the information they need to make decisions. Some of those decisions you want to make today, some of those decisions you're making for your future, like where am I going to go vacation and what do I need to pack for my vacation a, a week from now? So it's the same thing for advertisers. It's really about how do you connect those brands and those marketers with those consumers and have them anticipate what their actions may be so they can better serve them and they can better, frankly, uh, wisely use their dollars, right? Because they, they can have propensity of if a customer is going to be interested in their products. So I think there's a real value. Then you can have a real value from a supply chain perspective because you can use the weather data. It can be predicted about 15 days. So if you look at cold and flu season, we have a partner that uses our data to look 15 days out to make sure their supply chain and, and their products in their store that the shelf, the, um, you know, the shelves are stocked, which is really important. A couple of years ago, before we had a predictive flu product, you know, we, the flu season was really bad um, and nobody really predicted how bad it was going to be. And shelves in the, in the drug stores were bare because, you know, companies that make cold products, they couldn't get them into the store fast enough. So that can really help a company from a supply chain perspective, which, you know, and hen, you know, helps their entire business, not just on the advertising side, but it can be really beneficial to be able to use that kind of technology across the, you know, the entire ecosystem with, for a brand. I'm really glad you asked that question, uh, Peggy, because it was a great question and a great answer. And this is getting so meta because we're talking to a company about predictive AI whose business is predicting the future. <laughs> and now we're adding another level of meta here because I'm going to ask you, I think our final question, what does the future hold for you, for the weather company? What are the next steps on this journey of subscriptions, of engagement? So it really is the mission and the root of the, of the weather company. And that's not going to change is to, to help give people the best forecasting, you know, possible, the most accurate forecasting. It's going to be really important because our climate is changing. We're seeing more uh, severe weather, some unpredictable. We can forecast it, but, you know, you're, you're seeing really interesting anomalies in the wintertime, um, you know, versus, you know, what we see, you know, during hurricane season last season record hurricane season. Um, and so we're starting to see severity of weather change. So it's really our responsibility to ensure people have that information so they stay safe. Then they can make decisions for just their everyday lives as well. We can we will continue to do that in the subscription way as well, but we're going to go even further. We're going to be able to offer people more in-depth information around weather. Some people really just, you know, kind of geek out uh, on the weather data and they want more information. And so we're going to give that to them, um, you know, and we'll do it in a subscription way because it is, a, it can be a niche for some, from some users. So I think the, you know, the future for our business, but the really the industry as a whole for subscriptions is really bright. You know, if I look at what happened with cable a long time ago, a lot of individual cable subscriptions, right? So John, you have your 15, mm -hmm. right? 
and now and then you start seeing bundling happen. I do think that that will be part of the app subscription as well. I think we'll start seeing possibly some bundling um, because I, I do think there is that tipping point too with how many subscriptions do you want, right? But if you start bundling it and add more value, um, I do think that that's in our future. Sherry, that is a new thought. I have not heard yeah. anybody say that. We hear a lot of stuff. Imagine that. Here's your social bundle. Here's yeah. your search bundle, your productivity bundle. Wow. Uh, Sherry, this has been so much fun. Thank you for taking some time out of your schedule to chat with us. Oh, so happy. Great to see both of you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry.